The Lord be with you. And with your A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus told his disciples a parable. Can a, can a blind person guide a blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? No disciple is superior to the teacher, but when fully trained, every disciple will be like his teacher. Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the wooden beam in your own? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove that splinter in your eye when you do not even notice the wooden beam in your own eye? You hypocrite. Remove the wooden beam from your eye first, then you will see clearly to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. A good tree does not bear rotten fruit, nor does a rotten tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For people do not pick figs from thorn bushes nor do they gather grapes from brambles. A good person out of the store of goodness in his heart produces good, but an evil person out of the store of evil produces evil. For from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. The Gospel of the Lord. The blind leading the blind. And what happens when the blind lead the blind? They both fall into a pit. And the pit we can think of is the, really the pit of the netherworld, the pit of hell. And so it is incredibly important that we are seeing and that we walk on the path of truth and that our lives don't produce evil, but produce good. From an evil person out of the store of evil produces evil. And so a good person out of the store of goodness produces good. So today, as we, uh, as we start our journey, as we really begin uh, to look very seriously at our Lenten season, and I, I know we're gonna start on Ash Wednesday, but I think today is a day I wanna use the idea that we are approaching the season of Lent, a time of grace. You know, the season of Lent is the season of grace. It is a season of healing, it is a season of renewal, yes, of, of disciplines and fasting and those things, but this time of grace and renewal. So I want to challenge you to think a little bit, prepare yourself for a fruitful Lenten season. You know, I'm a, I'm a priest, I've been a priest for 16 years. I'm happy to be a priest. It's a great privilege to be a priest, it's a great privilege to be a member of the church, the Catholic Church, the fullness of faith given to the church by our Lord as uh, something entrusted to her to be passed on. Now, I think about the state of the church today, and I have stood up here on more than one occasion and expressed that I'm heartbroken about the state of the church. I'm heartbroken about the state of our culture. But you know, we can't point our fingers out at the culture. We are supposed to be the ones that transform the culture around us. We can't blame the culture on the state of the church. We have to recognize that the state of the church has something to do with the collapse of our culture. And so we're asking, are we being fruitful or not? And I'm afraid that the reality is the church, particularly in the Western world and Western civilization, has not been bearing much good fruit lately. It's been a bit of fruitlessness. A good tree does not bear rotten fruit and a rotten tree does not bear good fruit. So we have to recognize that as in some respects, the church is in a kind of collapse. What can we do 
not pointing our fingers out there, pointing at the beams in other people's eyes, but ask, what can we do to transform our culture? What can we do to have fruitful lives that bring about the kingdom of God? You know, uh, it's no mystery to me why we have a great shortage of priests, why we have a kind of collapse in marriages, a collapse in baptisms, a closing of churches, a rise of immorality, sexual immorality, suicide, abortion, fatherlessness. It's because our faith is not lived. And our faith isn't lived because unfortunately, all too often it hasn't been proclaimed. And why has the faith not been proclaimed vigorously and courageously? Because it's difficult. It's difficult. You know, I preached last week about the two ways. The two ways. And not, not, not all of you were necessarily here. But there are two ways. And which way are we going? And Jesus, it's the same thing today. Either we're a good tree producing good fruit or a bad tree producing bad fruit. And so what am I going to ask myself of myself this Lenten season? What am I going to ask of you this Lenten season? To examine if our lives are bearing fruit and what can we do to, uh, to be more fruitful? Now, how did our church, how did our culture, how did we get in the state that we're in today? Not too much of a history lesson, but just a little bit. I think 50 or 60 or 70 years ago, there was this kind of great optimism. There was this great moment of progress. And in this moment of progress, there was this forgetfulness, a forgetfulness of some of the really foundational truths of faith. And there was this turning away from the sacred scripture and something called the natural law. You've heard me mention the natural law before, some of you have. What is the natural law? I think for many people, the first thing they think of when they hear the natural law is, you know, the survival of the fittest, right? And there's an element of the survival of the fittest in the natural law. Or you think, you hear natural law and you think, oh, the, the laws of physics and chemistry and that kind of stuff. Well, a little bit of that too. But no, the natural law, when we think of it theologically, is this. Nobody gets the mother of the year award for being a selfish mother, do they? Say no, Father Mark, no. no. That's not why you get the mother. Why do you get the mother of the year award? For being unselfish. We know what is good, don't we? No soldier gets an award for showing cowardice in battle, right? No, they get an award for doing what? Showing bravery. So we have these elements that we're called to honesty and bravery and sacrifice. And we know that, right? Because it's written into our soul. And it's written into our soul by what? By the natural law. By the natural law. So honesty, uh, fidelity, faithfulness in marriage, those kind of things, respect of others, selflessness and sacrifice, all of that is written into our soul by the natural law. And the sacred scripture teaches us this and challenges us to these things. But unfortunately, we entered a time in the church where there was this tremendous tremendous rejection, I know that sounds crazy, a rejection of the difficult reality of the natural law and many of the difficult lessons of sacred scripture. And so this time of rejection has brought about a time of tremendous confusion and collapse and disobedience and, and decline and pre-shortages and sexual immorality and scandal and my brothers and sisters, that's the fruit we're living in right now, isn't it? That's the fruit. That's the fruit. Now, I have to be very, very careful standing up here. I don't want to point my finger out at somebody else's splinter in their eye where we all have our own two by fours, right? So we're here not today to point fingers except right here and say, how can my life be fruitful? What can I do to have a fruitful spiritual life? Not a watered down secular philosophy that denies some of the fundamental truths of our Christian faith. Recently, 
I was reading a, a book. I read it about 25 years ago and it had a great impact on me. I'm reading it again now. It's by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis is probably most famous for the Chronicles of Narnia in today's world, but he has another book a theological book called Mere Christianity. And in Mere Christianity, he holds up the natural law in such a clear and convincing way. And so I would encourage you all to uh, consider reading that book. The other day, not the other day, some years ago, I was in a class with a friend of mine named Joseph. And Joseph and I were sitting in class together and the teacher, the person presenting the course, wrote on the chalkboard in big letters that, and it was a she, her goal that day was confusion. I'm a seminarian. I'm learning about the faith. This woman's goal that day, written on the board, was to confuse us. My friend Joseph turned to me and said, rarely will the devil show himself so clearly. You know, we do live in a time of confusion about good and bad and right and wrong. And some of that has been taught. Some of it has been taught, sadly. But it is time for us to recognize that what is the season of Lent that we're approaching? Not a time of confusion, a time of clarity. Not a time of distraction, a time of focus. Not a time of you know, another uh, marathon of watching television. No, a time of reading and prayer and study, a season of grace, a season of renewal. You know, I started this homily by talking about the two ways, the two ways, the two kinds of tree, the tree that bears good fruit and the tree that bears bad fruit. And what is the consequences of going the wrong way? What is the consequences of a life that bears bad fruit? Now, another one of those disciplines, one of those truths, one of those doctrines of the faith that has gotten very little airtime over the last 50 or 60 years is the consequence of sin. What is the, what is the wages of sin? Death. And we're talking about eternal death. So this battle over our soul and the seasons of the church given to us, and I'm going to challenge you again, particularly in this season of Lent, for it to be a season of grace, healing, and renewal, and fruitfulness. I remember again somebody telling me some years ago that there Jesus wouldn't send anybody to hell. And there's two things I think about when I hear something like that. I think when you say, my Jesus wouldn't do this or that, I think be very careful because you're making up your own Jesus, okay? And when you make up your own Jesus, we call that idolatry. We make up our own God, we fashion him in our image, and we bow down and worship him. That's called idolatry. We have to take Jesus at who he is and how he presented himself to us. And the second thing I thought is that Jesus doesn't so much send people to hell as he lets them go there. They go to their own place. They follow the path of the way. Their unfruitful lives, that's where the fruit, that's, that's it, it's the rotten fruit. And so when the Bible describes Judas, it speaks about Judas as going to his own place. And so we have these two ways. We have this spiritual battle. We, have, we live in an age of this tremendous unfruitfulness, sadly. Like it or not, Jesus spoke about the consequences of a fruitless life. Like it or not, Jesus spoke about the consequences of going the wrong way. The divine mercy, Sister Faustina, my, one of my favorites. What a great gift it has been to get to know Sister Faustina and read her book and learn about the mercy of God and the hope that we can have in the mercy of God to the moment of our death. But in the Divine Mercy, Sister Faustina says this. She says, I, Sister Faustina, by the order of God, visited the abyss of hell so that I might tell souls about it and testify to its existence. The devil there was full of hatred for me, but he had to obey me at the command of God. 
What I have written is a pale shadow of the things that I saw. But one thing I noticed is that the souls there, very many of them disbelieved that there was such a place as hell. And she went on to describe the punishments of hell as the first one as being the absence of God. And gosh, so many people today are living in a kind of hell even now in the absence of God. And another one is the blasphemies against God. And when I hear God being blasphemed in the absence of God, I think a little bit of hell is, is breaking into earth. Now, my brothers and sisters, why am I talking about all of this today? I'm talking about all of this today because Sister Faustina came to the end of her visit to the abyss and she says, consequently, I pray even more fervently for the conversion of sinners. I incessantly plead, I proclaim, I live, I strive. And what was she striving to do? To live a fruitful life. To live a life of spiritual fruitfulness. So I want us, I want this congregation to embark on a season of great fruitfulness that we would enter into a fruitfulness. And what are the fruits that I want you to have? Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and generosity and faithfulness. And those things draw people in. Those gifts draw people in. People come to me and God knows that maybe their children have been malformed or given a bad education or told that it didn't really matter if they go to church or there's no such thing as hell or whatever it is and their children don't go to mass anymore how many times have i heard this how many times have i had people say to me what can i do and you know what i say one of the things that i say i say be joyful be joyful have joy in your faith and that will draw people to you that will draw people to the lord be fruitful so my brothers and sisters we enter the season of lent it's not a season to go around moping and beating ourselves spare me from sour-faced saints let us have a joyful fruitful life a good tree bears good fruit i am hopeful i am joyful i'm sober about the state of affairs right but we are entering into a season of grace. We are entering into a season of renewal. So this Lenten season, I pray that you would take very seriously the call to pray and to fast and to give, to ask and to seek and to knock. I'm not sure exactly how praying and fasting and giving works, but I know it does. Okay, I know it does. So we pray, we fast, we give, we strive to have a fruitful life that bears good fruit, that draws other people to the way. The last point I'm going to make, and I'm going to make it very briefly, is that Pope Francis has asked us, all the world, to pray and fast on Ash Wednesday, this coming Ash Wednesday, for peace in the Ukraine and between the peace Ukraine and Russia. You know, we live in an age of war and rumors of war, constantly. And how do we overcome those things? How, what is the weapons that we can use against those things? Prayer, fasting, giving, a life of fruitfulness, a true understanding of the good, the bad, the way, and then the wrong way. So I pray you have a great Lent, a fruitful Lent, a Lent that draws others to the way of Christ.